Hello everyone. In this video we are going to look at the definition of entropy as it appears in information theory. Now, at first this may seem like a fairly unintuitive thing because entropy, as we've talked about in previous videos, is concerned with physical systems and physical states, whereas information doesn't really feel like a physical thing in and of itself. It maybe feels like a way we can characterise other physical things or group them in convenient ways, but it doesn't feel like its own physical thing. But it was actually the work of Claude Shannon, who is often referred to as the father of information theory, which was able to demonstrate that information really is a physical object in its own right. So in this video we are going to look at Shannon's definition of the information content of a statement or an event, whatever it might be, and we will then look at the definition of entropy that naturally follows from this. In future videos, we will then link that to the definitions of entropy we've seen in previous videos and talk about entropy and thermodynamics in general. Um, but it's worth talking a little bit at this stage about how we can start to get an idea of why it is that entropy and information are so inextricably fundamentally linked together. And I'd like to do that with a thought experiment. So let's imagine I'm a farmer and I have um, a number of sheep in a field and I want to count up the sheep and then record how many sheep I have. Now, how can I do this? How can I record that information? And importantly, how can I record it in the most basic fundamental way possible using as few physical objects as possible? Well, if I'm really thinking fundamentally, maybe I should think at an atomic scale. So what I could do is if I've got a bunch of carbon atoms, say, I could, um, for each sheep I count in the field, I could um, excite one of these carbon atoms into a very high energy state, which doesn't naturally occur in nature. And then I can come back later and I can say, look, well, I've got 12 highly excited carbon atoms, uh, which I've put a lot of radiation in to get them excited. And that means I've got 12 sheep in the field. Or another way I could do it is um, I could start building a solid. And for every sheep in the field, I could add 10 molecules to my solid and then I could come back later and I say right I have a solid here of 120 molecules that means I've got 12 feet sheep in my field. Now there are a number of different ways that I could record this information but the important point here is that however I choose to record it in some sense I have to create order in a system where previously there was no order. Um, and that's the key point here, because we know from our definition of entropy in statistical mechanics, which I will link down below if you haven't seen that video, that entropy is concerned with going from ordered systems to chaotic systems. That the second law of thermodynamics tells us that if we have an ordered system, over time that system will always become more chaotic. That order is not a stable state of affairs in the universe. Um, but when we are storing information, we have to put some amount of work in in order to create order out of chaos. We have to create order where previously there was no order. So the act of creating information is taking our system from a higher entropy state to a lower entropy state. And then likewise, when it comes time to erase that information, well, I can allow my excited carbon atoms to radiate that energy I put into them to go into a lower entropy state or I can allow my solid, which I've built up out of molecules, to vibrate itself apart, and those molecules can start flying around the room. Um, but the, port the important thing to note is that when we are erasing information, we are taking our ordered state and we are allowing it to become chaotic again. So the erasure of information is linked to going from a state of order to a state of chaos, or to put it scientifically, from going from a state of low entropy to a state of high entropy. So that's kind of an intuitive way of thinking about why information and entropy are so fundamentally connected. But let's get into the meat of this and let's talk about Shannon's work and Sharon's, Shannon's derivations. And first up, we need to discuss information content. So to begin to think about the idea of information content, consider the following three statements. Statement number one. Alice's birthday falls on a particular day of the year. Statement two, Alice's birthday falls in the first half of the year. Statement three, Alice's birthday falls on the 15th of a month. Now, all three of those statements have different probabilities for being true. 
the probability of the first statement being true is 1. It's 100%. Alice must be born on a particular day of the year. The probability of the second statement being true is a half. She has half of the chance of being born in the first half of the year. And the probability of the third statement being true is a twelfth. Now, it's also clear that each one of those um, statements has a different amount of information content. We learn a different amount from each statement. So the information content of the first statement that Alice was born on a particular day of the year is zero. We don't learn anything new from hearing that statement. Whereas the information content from the third statement is the greatest. With the absence of any prior information, if we are told the third statement and told it is true, we have learned the most amount of information from those three statements. So already we can make the following fairly intuitive um, statement that as probability P increases, so as the probability of the statement is, um, is more likely, then the information content, which is written as Q, decreases. So if the statement has a 100% chance of being true, like Alice is born on one day of the year, or a, a particular day of the year, that's definitely true. It's got a probability of one, and it's got a very low information content. Whereas a statement which has a much lower probability of being true, like Alice was born on the 15th of a month, has a much lower probability, and so has a much higher information content. Now also, apologies, in the past videos we've been using Q to represent heat, but Q is also the symbol which is used to represent information content. Apologies for that. That's just the way it is. Right. Um, well, what else can we say about probabilities? So, um, if I have two statements, so let's say the probability, as we have, the probability of statement two being true is a half, and the probability of statement three being true is 1 over 12, then we know from about probabilities that the probability of 2 and 3, the probability that they are both true, um, is equal to 1 half multiplied by 1 12, which is equal to 1 over 24. And this is always the case when our two statements are independent from one another, when one doesn't in some way imply the other. So statements two and three are independent, so the statements, the, the probability of statement two and three both being true is equal to the multiplication, the product, of the individual probabilities. Um, and I don't want to get into probabilities and how they work too much in this video. If that's something you'd like to see, please let me know below. There's certainly a huge amount of really interesting stuff we can cover when it comes to probabilities. Um, but so this is how probabilities work. They work in a multiplicative way. But it also makes sense, if we're thinking about information content, that information content should be additative. That if we are told statement 2 and statement 3, then when we are told each one, we are gaining amount, a certain amount of information, and we can add the information we're getting with each subsequent statement. So we want our, our information content to be additive. And that is what motivated Shannon to adopt the following definition for information content. He said, the information content Q is defined as being equal to minus K, which is a constant, log P, where P is the probability. So this is how Shannon defined information content. And let's just see then how um, this works in an additive sense. So if I have um, the information content from well, firstly, one of the things about logarithms is that one of the rules of logarithms is that if I have two logs added together, if I have log A plus log B, then one of the rules about logarithms is that this is equal to the log of the product of A and B, log of A times B. So if I am adding up the information content of the second statement to the third statement, q2 plus q3, then let's use this equation, q2 minus k log of a half, and then q3 is minus k log of a twelfth, 
and then using this rule of logarithms, that is equal to minus k log of a half multiplied by a twelfth, which is equal to minus k log of 1 over 24. But this 1 over 24 is equal to the probability of 2 and 3 being together. So this is also equal to q23. If we are just taking the probability um, of statements, both statements 2 and 3 being true together. So the important thing to note is that we define the information content in this way because we want our information content to be additive, but when we are combining probabilities of inde independent statements, the probabilities combine in a multiplicative way. So that is what motivated Shannon to define the information content in this way. Um, and what else can we say about, about this at this stage? Well, let's just, um, let's just dive a little bit more into the formula. So we have a log here. So the log function looks like this. Um, so if I have over here x and on the y-axis I have log of x, then the log function looks something like that. Um, and it crosses the x-axis at 1. So log of 1 is equal to 0. Um, and probability is between 0 and 1, right? A probability of 0 means something never happens. A probability of 1 means it always happens. So the probability is always over here, which means log of the probability is always negative. Um, and in order for q to increase as probability falls, as probability falls, this becomes more negative, but we want q to become greater, to become more positive. So k is a positive constant. Um, so that is how Shannon defined the information content Q. Um, what we're going to do next is look at the definition of entropy that follows on from this. So let's now assume that we have a set of statements and that the information content of the ith statement in this set, Q subscript I, is equal to minus K log of p subscript i, the probability of the i-th statement, right? Now, what we want to do is measure the average information content, the expected value of information content we get when we're told something about our system. And that um, expected information content, well, the way we calculate expected values is that we sum up over all the statements over everything in our system of the probability of each statement multiplied by the information content for each statement. This is just how expected values work. Again, I'm not going to go into that, but please let me know if you would like to go into this in more detail. Um, and what is this equal to? Well, this is equal to minus k, we'll bring the constant out the front, and then the sum over i of um, pi log of pi. And uh, there's different ways we can set the base of this logarithm and this constant. If we were to set k equal to 1 and log equal to uh, log base 2, then this is measured in bits, um, and that's very useful for a lot of things. But if we were to set k equal to kb and log equal to log base e, the natural logarithm, then what we have is the entropy s, which is equal to this expected value of qi, the average qi, is equal to minus kb, the sum over i of pi ln of pi. And this is the expression for the Shannon entropy. And the eagle-eyed among you will notice that this is exactly the same as the expression for the Gibbs entropy, which is the probabilistic entropy, which we saw in the last video. So this is the expression for entropy as devised by Shannon in terms of the probability of statements as they relate to the information we get from those statements. And what does this mean? What, how can we think about this equation? Well, um, so in one sense, uh, what this equation tells us 
is the amount of information we gain about our system following a statement about that system or following a measurement of that system. Um, so the higher the entropy, the higher the expected information content, which means that we learn much more about our system than we knew before. Whereas if we have a very low entropy, that means we have a very low expected information content, which means following a statement, we are unlikely to learn much more about our system. Um, now, how can we think about this in terms of statistical mechanics and relate it to the previous definitions of entropy we've seen? Well, remember, in the statistical mechanics video we did about entropy, we said that a high entropy state has a very large number of corresponding microstates to it that our system can be in any one of a vast number of arrangements of particles and molecules, whereas a very low entropy state has much fewer uh, microstates associated with it. So a low entropy state, SL, might have um, microstates um, NL equal to 10 associated with it, whereas a high entropy state, SH, might have the number of microstates associated with it, NH, equal to um, 1 million, say, right? Um, so if we then were to, um, to get some information about each one of these states, right? Say we, we get a piece of information about our low entropy state, which narrows down the possible microstates from 10 to 8, right? Um, we haven't learned a whole lot more about that system. But if we have a very high entropy system, we might be able to narrow down the number of possible microstates from a million to 500,000, say, or 800,000. The point is that we are able to learn um, much more about um, our system when the entropy is higher, because each statement eliminates many, many more options. So that is kind of how these two definitions of entropy are linked. So in statistical mechanics, it's related to the number of possible microstates a system has associated with it. In information theory, it's associated with the amount of information we gain on average um, following a statement, a true statement about that system. Now, I appreciate that these kind of still feel a bit disparate. So what we're going to do in the next video is we are going to look at a couple of applications of this entropy because we haven't done many problems for a little while. So I think it's good to actually do that work through a couple of problems. Um, and then in the video following that, we are going to talk more generally about entropy and thermodynamics and statistical mechanics and information theory and sort of piece this all together a little bit more. I look forward to seeing you then.